Okay, good evening. Um, thanks for coming along to listen tonight, and thank you for inviting me in. I've, uh, I've been asked to talk about CCTV. <coughs> CCTV is a topic that I've done lots of research on uh, over a number of years, um, and I'm going to. I have a series of slides. What I've done is I've tried to um, put together a series of slides which will help convey a set of ideas about CCTV, a set of perspectives that I'd like us to think about. What I have done is I've had some slides which are quite descriptive, some slides which are maybe presenting different positions. Um, I'm not expecting you all to agree with me, but uh, what I'd like you to do is to think maybe about some of the different perspectives that I'm going to try and bring forward. Um, I also have stripped out any kind of hardcore academic uh, theory because I think that will just bore you to tears. So I've tried to put the slide, make the slides as interesting as possible. If um, there's something on a slide that you really don't understand or you don't agree with or you want to raise a question, please just interrupt me. Um, I'm used to being heckled by students and other academics, so it's not a big deal. Um, first of all, though, I thought it would be useful, make sure, um, just to say a little bit about myself. Now, um, I don't want to spend ages talking about myself, obviously, but I thought it would be useful to give you an idea about the sorts of, sorts of background I have in terms of the sorts of perspectives then that I'm going to bring forward. Okay, so my academic background is I have a, a first degree in public administration. I've also um, taught public management for many years, and I have a, a PhD which looks at, at new technologies and public policy. So the perspectives that I'm very much interested in are those around public policy processes. So I'm interested in how public policy emerges, I'm interested in how public services and public institutions exist and interact with each other, and how services are delivered as a result. So this, if you like, is my background. At Stirling, I'm the director of an MBA, which is for public service managers. In terms of research, um, I have a number of research commitments uh, around surveillance technologies. So over the years, I have developed uh, an area of expertise around public policy and surveillance. So at the moment, I'm the chair of this uh, Living in Surveillance Society's cost action that Ian mentioned. Now, this is a research programme, a four-year research programme. We have over 150 academics from 26 different countries looking at different perspectives about what it means to live in a surveillance society. So the premise is very simple here. The idea is that with new technologies... We leave little electronic footprints all the time. And these little footprints leave surveillance traces. So surveillance then is a very broad concept. Surveillance is embedded in mobile phones. It's embedded in our use of the internet. It's embedded in satellite navigation systems. And also more explicit technologies like CCTV. So basically this research program is trying to understand what it means to live in a society where we're surrounded by so much surveillance. Um, I'm also the director of a new research centre, which is um, looking at surveillance and privacy. This is, a, uh, a new, this, is, this is to be launched in the autumn, and it's a joint initiative with Stirling, the Open University and the University of Edinburgh. It's the first research centre interested in broad surveillance issues. And then this is another, I've just put this down here, this is another big research project that we're leading at the moment called Increasing Resilience in Surveillance Societies. The idea of this project is how societies adapt how they respond and how, how they resist or um, how people behave differently as a result of living in a surveillance society. Um, and you can find all of those things, much more information about all of those things on the internet. Okay, so my background then, public services, public policy, with an interest in surveillance technologies more generally. But what I'm going to talk about this evening is, ex is CCTV explicitly. CCT obviously is much more of an overt surveillance technology. We all understand that it's a surveillance technology and we're all familiar with the idea that there are surveillance cameras around. Okay, now I thought as a starting point, um, I've labelled my, my presentation this evening um, the myths and realities of CCTV. So I want to kind of set up some assumptions about CCTV that I then want to go on and knock down. Okay, but as a starting point... I thought it would be useful to also talk about some assumptions about surveillance more generally. And this, if you like, gives you a, um, an indication about the sorts of um, ways that we think about surveillance in terms of the, the, the community of surveillance scholars that are emerging. Okay, now there are a number of perceptions of surveillance which uh, exist, and as, a, as, a, as an academic, we can unpick those. So, for example... 
there is this idea that there is something called Big Brother. Now, um, we're all familiar with the term Big Brother. We're all familiar with 1984. We're all familiar with the concept of the state surveying citizens. The problem with the Big Brother concept, it assumes that the state is a coordinated single entity surveying all of us and controlling all of us. Now, the reality is that the state is very fragmented. Different agencies do different things, and they don't always agree with each other, and CCTV is a really good example of that, as I'll come on to explain. So, the idea that Big Brother is something that we should, we should actually uh, question. Also, this idea that we live in a surveillance society. Okay, so I've contradicted myself already. I started on the very first slide by saying that I was interested in a surveillance society. This was an area of, of work that I was particularly interested in. Now, the problem with the surveillance society is it assumes that, that, that society is, is a complete unified object. And what I would argue, actually, is that societies are different in different places. So, for example... The ex our experiences of surveillance in the UK are completely different to how people perceive and experience and feel about surveillance if you go into Eastern Europe. And this, again, could be something that's borne out with CCTV. CCTV is resisted in many parts of Eastern Europe because of their past. They have a different experience of the state surveying them, and they are much more resistant to the idea that the state has a right to survey them that closely. So, actually we should talk about surveillance societies. So it's not the surveillance society, it's surveillance societies. That they're different, there are different institutional arrangements, different attitudes towards surveillance in different countries. And then finally, there's another assumption that, um, that, that um, we can actually unpick right from the outset, and that is all surveillance is bad. As an academic, people always assume, or, or someone who's interested in CCTV, that I'm always against CCTV. And that the starting point is, oh, you'll, you'll be very critical of CCTV. Well, I may be very critical, but given the right governance of CCTV, given the right use of CCTV, it can be very useful. And equally, we can think about other sorts of surveillance. If we say that surveillance is quite a normal process built into all sorts of technologies, we can talk about the surveillance of infectious diseases, the surveillance of bad weather systems travelling around, around the globe. So surveillance actually has, um, has lots, of, lots of different... Um, uses in lots of different environments. So when I started out my PhD in the mid-90s, um, and I, I was searching for all the literature, on, I was looking for CCTV and there wasn't anything published, I tried surveillance. I found lots and lots of, um, lots and lots of articles about medical surveillance, particularly of HIV at that time. So you know, surveillance is also a useful thing. Now the interesting thing about surveillance is that it's actually quite a normal <coughs> state of affairs. We all understand what surveillance is, because we've all been brought up in, in a world of surveillance. Okay, so surveillance without technology. So we're brought into a family environment from a very early age where surveillance takes place by our parents. We're used to surveillance in schools. We're used to surveillance in religion. So surveillance is quite normal. But what we're, what we're interested in here is surveillance mediated by new technologies. And the new technology that we're going to look at this evening is CCTV. Now, I've just listed those as, a kind of, as, a, as an, opening, an opening shot, if you like. Um, now, for us, as I, for myself as a, as a scholar working in this, this area, this is particularly problematic because we have to overcome these hurdles all the time. We have to say that you know, we, we don't believe that there's necessarily a big brother and that um, we don't present the position that surveillance is always bad. We may be very critical of surveillance practices. We may be very critical of the state. Um, but it doesn't mean that we necessarily take these positions. Okay, so I thought that might be a, a useful, useful starting point. Okay, let's think about CCTV and, uh, and the UK. Okay, now we're all very familiar with CCTV in the UK. It's been around for quite a number of years now. And the UK is widely regarded as the world leader in CCTV. In the last couple of months, I've seen a number of reports saying that for the first time, the UK has been overtaken in terms of the number of public space CCTV cameras, and it's been overtaken by China. That's just been in the news in the last couple of months. Okay, so I thought I'd start with some numbers, okay? So, some numbers about CCTV in the UK. Now, here is a report from, on the Surveillance Society, uh, published by the Information Commissioner's Office in 2006. Now, this report didn't actually count cameras. Um, they were referring to other studies that had counted cameras. But you can look into there and see, um, see what they were quoting. So, someone out there has done some research saying there were 4.2 million CCTV cameras in the UK, so quite a lot. 
um, one camera for every 14 people, and that we each appear on CCTV over 300 times a day. Now, this is the very often cited facts about CCTV, that there are this many cameras. Now, this has been called into question by a number of people, um, and I actually know, I'm, I'm reasonably good friends with the person that, 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 that did that calculation, and he did it in a, in a, in a restaurant on a napkin, but, so, so there is some doubt about this. This also depends on, on what you mean by a surveillance camera and a surveillance system. Now, I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. Um, now, here, presumably, I think, that we're talking about all sorts of surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras in shops, surveillance cameras in public spaces, surveillance cameras in all sorts of areas. Okay, but actually, when, when we normally talk about CCTV in, in, in common uh, language, we are normally talking about CCTV in public places. That tends to be what we think about, a CCTV camera in the street. Okay, so more recently, the National CCTV Strategy, which was a, a central government report from the from ACPO, the Association of Chief Police Officers. Okay, now they estimated far fewer cameras, only 1.85 million, so the number's coming down. Um, and they estimated that the vast majority of those were private, there were some in transit, and they mean by transit, um, bus stations and buses and trains and things like that, and in a small proportion were town and city centres. So these, if you like, are probably the public space systems that we all think about. Okay. Okay. How many people are like, in shopping centres and the shops where the public can go into? Okay, um, now th you're, you're right to question these sorts of definitions because on the one hand, a shopping centre might be a private space, officially. Okay, so whether or not this calculation would count those cameras here, or whether or not they might count them here, I'm not sure. But you're right, there is, there is a problem in terms of how you count cameras. Um, and I'm going to have, I had some slides in a moment which makes the, the water even muddier. Okay, now, my, my, own, my own research, okay, so I did some research looking at CCTV, and part of that research was to count cameras. So instead of um, walking down streets and counting cameras, I did a survey of local authorities. Local authorities are predominantly the agencies responsible for, for public space systems. Okay, so I did, a, I did a survey of local authorities, and I found across the UK only 190,000 cameras. So actually, when you start to do empirical work, you start to really try to count exact cameras and exact systems, there are far fewer than we may think. For example, there's one local authority in Scotland that only this year installed its first public space systems. Okay, now you may all, but you're all scratching your head there thinking, I wonder where that is. Uh, I will tell you, it was Aberdeenshire. They have installed their first small public space system um, only very recently. Now, my, my research asked, um, wasn't just interested in uh, cameras in, in um, town and city centres. I also asked local authorities about whether or not they put cameras in residential areas, uh, for example, in flats or in schools or in libraries or in other areas that local authority was interested in. So... Um, this, this uses a different sort of definition to maybe this definition here. And the point of the slide is that maybe we overestimate the amount of surveillance cameras there are, and maybe we don't really have a very tight definition about the different types of cameras and where they are used. So if you like, this is, this is the first, the myth about CCTV is that the cameras are everywhere. Okay, now, the CCTV revolution in the UK... Okay, now this is, um, this is going back to the kind of mid-90s. Um, this is the sort of work that I did for my PhD. It feels like a long time ago. It was quite, it was quite interesting, like, re-looking at these slides again. And uh, so I brought some of them out. So this, if you like, is a synopsis. Okay, so what we see is a rapid diffusion of CCTV cameras and systems in the 1990s onwards. Okay, so we can, we can clearly see that something happens in the 1990s that means CCTV can be used widely. Okay, this is, this is not a new technology. Cameras, TV screens, recorders, telecommunications, this is an old technology. But something happens in the 1990s that allows those systems to diffuse widely. We start to see, in the 1990s, that they are used in a number of public and private places. So before the 1990s, you might find surveillance cameras in private places, but increasingly in this era, we see them emerging in public places. So we see them in town and city centres, residential areas, places where the public have general access, parks even, um, 
um, residential areas, uh, swimming pools, libraries, all sorts of places. Now, initially it was seen as a technological solution to problems associated with crime and crime and disorder. So the idea was CCTV would help combat crime. That was the initial premise. Okay? And if it, didn't, if it didn't stop crime, it would help catch the people who perpetrated crime. Now, over time, that evolved slightly, and it became also about antisocial and undesirable behaviour. So initially, it was seen as a tool to cut crime. Um, over time, it was seen that not just crime was the target of CCTV, but also things that were undesirable. Groups of young people hanging around, um, um, maybe people who were, who were drunk at night out in the street. This was CCTV was seen as a, as a good way of deterring those sorts of behaviour. In this period, we see that government <laughs> rhetoric is very supportive of CCTV. So the government ministers, for example, will come out with things like, if you've got nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. So this general very supportive rhetoric, making CCTV a possible policy option. We also start to see public support for CCTV. Now, um, public support for CCTV is undeniable. There's lots of evidence that the general public, in general terms, supports CCTV. But I would argue that whilst CCTV has a degree of support, there is also limited understanding of the capabilities of CCTV systems. Okay, so this is something I'm going to come on to in a few slides' time. The point here is that whilst we have an understanding that surveillance takes place through CCTV, we don't really understand how that takes place or the degree of intimacy that's taking place through that surveillance. Also, limited public debate on the use of consequences of CCTV. So the very early days of the expansion of CCTV in the UK, civil liberties organisations were very quiet about the civil liberties consequences of widespread use of CCTV. And again, it was because the rhetoric coming from government was so strong. Now, at the, at the beginning, there was very little robust evidence on the effectiveness, impacts and implica implications of using CCTV. Okay, so it was a new technology, it was a new policy solution. Nobody really knew how effective it would be. Okay, nobody knew that it actually would deter crime. Nobody knew what the impact on society would really be because it was a new technical solution to um, a set of policy problems. And also in this era, we see there very, a very weak legislative environment governing the use of CCTV. Now, this is quite interesting. CCTV, there are no, there's no specific legislation for CCTV then and there isn't now. They assumed that it could be covered by the Data Protection Act, the Human Rights Act. In other countries, CCTV was very slow to develop because, for example, in France they had laws about photography and about capturing people's images. So in other countries, different legislation halted the provision of CCTV. In this country, um, it, was, it was left to existing legislation. Now, we are about to have a new CCTV commissioner in the UK for the first time. Um, so things are slightly changing here, but still today we don't have a piece of legislation specifically about CCTV. What we have is regulation that comes through a code of practice issued by the Information Commissioner's Office. Okay, so this, if you like, are the, the main features of CCTV in the, the mid-1990s. Okay, now, let's go back to the problem of definition. Okay, now my argument here would be, hence the CCTV in, in inverted speech marks there, inverted commas, is that CCTV actually is a really poor name for what we have. Okay, closed circuit television camp system, surveillance system, video system. Okay, now closed circuit. Now the very early systems may have had a completely closed circuit. Um, they were also probably very expensive as a result. Um, also, they're not really about TV at all. You know, they're about cameras, they're about recording, they're about images. So actually, the term itself, it's a very British term, they talk more, much more on the continent about video surveillance. Okay, it's a very British term, but it has common currency now. But actually, when we think about a CCTV system, there is an awful lot of different things going on behind the camera. Okay, so we have the camera. It could be a fixed camera, it can be a mobile camera, it can be an analogue camera, increasingly they're digital cameras. Okay, so the cameras themselves... With their lens, the lenses can be of different, different quality and different power. Okay, so the camera, so to start off with, the cameras can all be quite different in a surveillance camera. Okay, we have some sort of telecoms infrastructure to broadcast the images back to a control centre or back to some sort of recording device. We have the visual display equipment, okay, maybe we have operators, you have camera controls. 
So these are the VDUs. We have recording and storage equipment. We might have a control centre, so the sort of things you see on TV where people sitting in front of banks of cameras. Uh, or if there's not a control centre, it might just be a, a, a storage facility storing the images. They don't always have control centres. We have street furniture. Okay, street furniture sounds a bit odd, but I meant the poles and the signs and the protection um, that you might, you might get around a surveillance camera. We have the operators, including the training that they may have, um, including the day-to-day the -day practices that they engage in. Um, so these, these may be monitoring norms. How do, how do, what do they look for when they're undertaking surveillance? What, what sort of advice have they been given about how to spot the perpetrators of, of whatever they're looking for, crime or, or other practices? We have operational guides, including codes of practice. We have regulation, including this non-specific legislation that I was referring to. We have management processes, including finance arrangements, performance indicators, believe it or not. You know, so there are, there are accountability and oversight arrangements to check what the, what the operatives do, how the money is spent on surveillance cameras. And then we have also links into the criminal justice system, which allow um, the footage of cameras to be used in prosecutions. So actually, a CCTV system may initially pop into your mind as a camera, but actually when we look behind the camera, there is a, a, a mountain of different things going on. And this is why there is a slight problem with this term CCTV system, because not every camera is the same. Actually, every camera is almost going to be different. So when you walk down the street and you see a camera and you say to yourself, there's a surveillance camera, the next question should be, I wonder what it's doing, or to what, what is it doing with that image, or how good is that image, where is that image going? I'm going to come back to this, this a bit later, because it's about public awareness and, and public understanding. So when I walk down the street and I see a surveillance camera, I don't know what it's doing. So, and I've been looking at surveillance cameras for a, a number of years. So again, you know, this is a definitional problem. Okay, now this is a, this is a, um, this is a very old slide. This is one that, was, uh, that I had in my PhD, but it's useful and I think it's, it's quite interesting. As I haven't really seen it surpassed. So what, what I tried to do here is I was specifically interested in public space systems and I was interested in the different sorts of systems that I was uncovering in my research. And I found essentially four types of system. And now this, this goes back to our understanding of what surveillance does and how it works. Okay, so I called the four systems proactive, reactive, non-active. Um, I called it autoactive, the fourth category. Um, we now call this sort of uh, CCTV system as a smart CCTV system, but I wasn't smart enough to think of that name at the time. I thought of autoactive. Anyway, so the proactive system. Now, I would bet that this is probably what most of you think of when you think of a CCTV system. You think that there is a camera recording your image, the image goes back to a dedicated control room, there is recording facilities there, and there is, a, there is an operator. There is an operator guiding the cameras and then doing something when they see some incident occurring. Maybe they call the police, maybe they call a traffic warden, maybe they call a, um, a, a city helper or whatever. So they do something. There's, this is live surveillance. It's proactive. Now, this is what I think most people think exists. Actually, this sort of system, the reactive system, is far more common. Um, this is where you have the camera's images being captured and they're recorded and they're stored and they're available at a later date, maybe for an investigation, maybe to prove something did or didn't happen. So this provides active access to the footage after the incident. Okay? And this is what is often used in a court of law. This is a much more reactive system. There isn't really any live proactive surveillance taking place. Now this system here, your non-active system, now you typically won't find a public authority having this sort of system, it's not against the law, but um, this is the sort of system you may find in a private premises, not really a public, public agency wouldn't do this particularly. So this is where there isn't any monitoring, there isn't really any, there may not even be a lens in the camera, it may just be a box without a wire. But to the general public, to the person walking past it, it looks like a surveillance camera. So it may actually have the same effect as some of these other systems. It may stop me mugging somebody because I see the camera. But actually, it's a dummy camera. It gives the illusion of surveillance. Now, most public agencies, as I've said, wouldn't engage in such a system. Um, but some, there's nothing to stop a, a private shop, um, shop doing that. And sometimes you, you see a uh, little... Uh, paper signs up saying you are being recorded on surveillance cameras and not only do you get dummy sign, uh, dummy cameras, I think you get dummy signs and there aren't really any surveillance cameras at all. 
Okay, and then we come down to the, uh, the auto-acting system. Now, this is where you have computerized surveillance. Okay, so this is where there is some form of automated intelligence system that's undertaking the surveillance. Now, it could be that there is some data matching taking place. Face recognition, for example. I'm going to talk more about, I have a slide on smart CCTV in a moment. Okay, so now this is where the expansion is at the moment. This is where the sorts of systems that are being developed are in this area. Now, so um, we may have all of these other sorts of systems, but these are the systems that are really being pushed by the technology companies, um, and there are some different reasons for that that I'll come on to. Again, this, this gives you a, a good example of why we have to be really careful when we talk about what a definition is of CCTV. Okay, now, these are, this is my myths and realities slide. Um, so I have down, down one side some myths, and I have down one side some alternative realities. You don't have to agree with me on all of these, um, and some of them do blend into each other a little bit. Okay, so first of all, CCTV cameras work. This, is, this, this could be a myth. Now, the evidence, I'm not a criminologist, as I said at the beginning. Um, the, evidence, the most robust evidence I've seen um, from criminologists is that CCTV may work in certain circumstances. And those certain circumstances tend to be very closed environments. So the closed environment, like a car park, where there's one way in and one way out, and the surveillance cameras can be very focused. Or an airport. So, for example, an airport where you're funneled down a certain corridor. So it's easy to survey people, and it's easy to track them. Okay, so CCTV does seem to have... Um, some, um, the criminology says has some evidence that it works in those circumstances. In terms of public space systems, there's no evidence that CCTV really works in terms of reducing crime, in terms of deterring crime, in terms of reducing or deterring antisocial behaviour. And if you remember, that was the reason why we apparently had CCTV, was for those purposes. Okay, so we can question whether or not CCTV works. We can at the very least question it. Um, as from my perspective, as, as someone interested in policy processes, if we question whether or not CCTV works, we have to question why we have them. How did we come to a situation where we have so many cameras if, if we're not sure if they work or not? The second, the second myth is that CCTV is everywhere. Um, and I think I'll probably try to kind of dispel that myth a little bit with my, my first few slides. So if we're interested in public space systems, if we're interested in the systems that are then provided by agencies of the state, be it local government, be it the police, uh, be it any other public agency, we're actually talking about far fewer cameras than, than, than we might think. Um, so far fewer are publicly owned and operated um, on behalf of local authorities or other public agencies. The third myth is that citizens want CCTV. Now, as I've said already, there is clear public support for CCTV. I can't tell you the amount of times over the years I, um, someone in a pub has asked me what I do for a living and I said, oh, I'm a researcher and uh, I've done some stuff on CCTV and they tell me how great it is. And if they could have it on their street pointing at their front door, they would. Okay, so there is a clear demand for CCTV. But what I would argue is that the support for CCTV is based on a misunderstanding about what CCTV delivers. And maybe even not a misunderstanding. Misunderstanding makes it sound like the general public have not understood CCTV. What I mean is it's very difficult to be aware of what a surveillance camera does and what a surveillance system does, a surveillance camera system. So it's very hard for us to be um, really in tune of the power of these systems um, and how they're used. I'm going to talk a bit more about smart CCTV in a moment to give you some more examples of that. Okay, now I have a feeling that if there was better understanding of CCTV, we may be a little bit more reluctant to have the, 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 the systems that we have. So this, is, this blends into this fourth one here about citizens understand the technological capabilities of CCTV. Now, why I've, I've called this, this, this as a separate myth is because, going back to the very beginning where I said surveillance was normal, okay? so we, we, we instinctively understand what CCTV does because we, we understand surveillance as a normal process that, that somebody may want to look over us to protect us, look after us and there, there, there is a, a kind of normality of that, it's not surprising okay so when, when citizens may not understand the technical purposes of CCTV the technical nuts and bolts and the capabilities they understand maybe the instinct of CCTV, the idea behind CCTV okay now the point of the reality, though, is that when we actually start to look at the technical capabilities of systems, it's almost impossible for us as lay people to understand what CCTV is capable of 
and um, where it may end up in the future with technological developments. And finally, the, 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 the fifth myth is that CCTV is there to protect us and to reduce crime. Okay, so I started off by saying that CCTV was a tool for crime and disorder, and it evolved into community safety, antisocial behaviour. Um, now it's evolved again into a tool that's used for anti-terrorism. Okay, so the purpose of CCTV over time, or the explicit purpose of CCTV, has evolved. But actually, behind CCTV, there are other purposes. So, for example, CCTV meets other policy objectives. It's typically installed in town and city centres. Not because they are... Uh, well, maybe partly because they have different sorts of crime problems, but to make those town and city centres more prosperous, commercial centres. There's a commercial imperative to CCTV. Um, you find also that CCTV then is talked about as the fifth utility. So it's uh, the, when you're building a new housing estate or you're building a new shopping centre, you need to make sure, as a commercial part of your exercise, that you build in the infrastructure for CCTV. So there is a strong, um, there's a strong commercial um, push behind CCTV. Um, so it's not just about crime and disorder, it fits other policy objectives. So, for example, if we look at, um, I'll just give you one example, which might be, um, we've all regularly seen surveillance cameras on gantries over the motorway or, or around, around major roads. Now, that's about traffic management. That's not crime and disorder. That's about managing the flows of traffic. Um, and the idea being there that you can, um, you can change the, the road signs, speed up, slow down the traffic. Um, you know when an incident has occurred, so you know to send out the, uh, the, the, the men to put some cones or whatever the case may be. So if we look in more detail at CCTV provision, we see that it meets a whole range of policy objectives and is used in different policy environments for different purposes. So the idea that it's just about crime and disorder is actually, I would argue, a myth. Okay, now here's my slide on smart CCTV. Um, now this is where some of the more interesting systems are being developed at the moment. And I've broken down these smart develops, developments into a kind of number of different areas. And what we essentially are talking about is that different systems are being integrated. The systems are being digitized, which allows them to be integrated. So they're using standard, um, standard uh, software, standard practices. They're being automated, so there's more computerized surveillance. They are being expanded, so different systems are being linked together. Um, and well, standardising computerisation. Okay, so let's just run down very quickly some of these different points. Okay, so what, we, what we're starting to see is that we're starting to see more centralised control centres um, operating more and more different surveillance systems. So, for example, there are three local authorities in the, the central belt of Scotland that have na now do not have their own separate control rooms. They share one. That's for financial reasons. Okay, so they have a shared control room and they've extended out those three different systems. Now that has led to some teething problems in terms of which, which cameras get priority of an evening. Um, and this has caused some problems between the three local authorities. But this central control centre is very important because this is actually the most expensive part of a CCTV system. The human operatives um, and the manning of these control centres. So this is the area where we, um, we will start to see more developments in the next few years. We also see um, the expansion of systems and the ad addition of new technical components. So, for example, we start to see new systems being added, new camera types being added into systems. So we're starting to see, for example, drones. Now, we don't see many... I've never seen a drone in Scotland, I must admit. Okay? But we may well see drones over the Olympics. Okay? We may well see drones around airports. Okay, now these will be linked into control centres and will be used as part of broader surveillance systems. Now I have seen in Glasgow policemen with, with CCTV head cams um, and I've also seen um, traffic wardens with CCTV cameras on their, on their badges. So we start to see more mobile cameras and these are being built into existing centralised control centres. We also start to see other sensors being integrated into, into CCTV. Um, so there are other devices that are being linked into systems. So, for example, um, it sounds quite interesting, doesn't it? Sniffing and listening devices. There is in, in Glasgow they've been trialling a listening device, which um, listens out for shouting and listens out for commotion. And when a commotion is registered by the computerised software, not a human operative, 
it will alert the operative to that particular camera and say, look, there's something going on here, please have a look. Um, we're starting to see also um, sniffing devices attached to cameras. These are mostly in airports and things. They're looking for drugs, obviously. Um, and again, the point here is that you can, you can add in different technologies into a surveillance camera system. So the idea being here is that a sensor, which maybe is sniffing, will alert a CCTV operative, but will already train the cameras to the, to the suspect person. Heat sensors are... Um, not, not new at all. Glasgow has been using these in schools for a number of years. So um, for the, the case here, for example, would be that most schools are pretty quiet of an evening and of a night. There shouldn't be any, any movement. So um, you can use an infrared device um, or a microwave device to sense any movement and, on a school property over the uh, overnight. And if there is some, somebody trespassing or somebody on the school premise, it will alert someone in a control centre to the school, to the camera, and they can do something about it. Now, the other development of CCTV that we're probably more familiar with is around image recognition and analysis. Okay, so they've been trying to do a number of these things for a number of years, and some of these, some of these systems are now getting quite sophisticated. I don't want to give you the impression that all CCTV systems do this. They don't. They are mostly trials. Some of them are more effective than others. They haven't been rolled out um, across, the, across the country or anything like that. Okay, so we can have face recognition systems. Okay, so a CCTV camera can identify us as individuals. Now, what they are trialling this with are, for example, known shoplifters, a database of known shoplifters. So they're the faces that are being matched. Everybody else is uh, pretty anonymous. Movement recognition is, is, actually, uh, is actually more effective than face. Face recognition is effective about 80% of the time. Movement recognition is, is, is actually more effective. So some examples of systems here would be... Um, at an airport, for example, if you go into an airport with a suitcase, um, an airport surveillance system will track all the people. They won't identify them, they'll track you all as you move around the airport. If you leave a large part of yourself behind, i.e. your suitcase, it will alert the control centre and you will quickly find a security card, card, card comes over to you. I'm not suggesting you will try that, but um, if, you, if it's ever happened to you, now you'll know why somebody comes over to you so quickly. A computerised system will say, well, that person is split in two. There's something going on there. Okay, so movement recognition. That also can be used for cars. You know, a car becomes an object on the computerised system and it can be tracked. And we have activity recognition. So, for example, um, they, there's, there is a very successful system which has been rolled out in swimming pools, um, which will identify very quickly a large floaty or a large object at the bottom of a swimming pool which isn't moving. Okay, so this, this is more, much more common now, um, which obviously would be somebody drowning. Um, and so we start to see these. Another activity recognition would be um, somebody, somebody, um, somebody running, you know, so a computerised system can identify that very quickly. And we have object tracking and analysis. Now this is, this is, um, this is what we're going, to be do, we're going to be trialing much more heavily in the Olympics. Okay, so they, want, they will be identifying, as, as I walk into, a, into a, a part of the Olympic area, I will be identified, not as, not as William Webster, but I'll be identified as Mr. X, that sounds good, um, and then I'll be tracked as I go, as I go around as Mr. X, will be, I'll be followed all the way around, and I'll be identified uh, throughout my whole time in, in, the, uh, in the Olympic area. Not, I'm not going to the Olympics, by the way, but um, I thought I would give that as an example. Um, ANPR are very, are very common now, very successful, automatic number plate recognition systems, um, and they are used for lots of different purposes, um, from traffic management to uh, keeping uh, the intelligence services use these for, for, tra for tracing people as well. Now the beauty of these systems is that uh, number plates on the whole are on the same place on your car. Um, they use the same letters, the same background, so that's why those systems, unlike our faces, are, are, much, are much more effective. Noise analysis, I already, I already mentioned. Um, so th th these are the sorts of things that typically are referred to in the literature as smart CCTV. There is some sort of computer analysis, some sort of algorithms taking place. Now, the most so sophisticated surveillance systems involving CCTV go a step further. Okay, so they are using also mobile phones or sat-nav in conjunction with CCTV to track individuals. Okay, now that 
is something that the intelligence services are more likely to use than your local authority. Um, but this maybe is the future of CCTV. And the other thing that's starting to be used much more is CCTV and profiling. Okay, profiling is used now in lots of different areas, from commercial companies to public agencies, um, and we all leave a lot of information about ourselves out there, uh, a lot of information that can be used for profiling. How many of you have Facebook? Okay, quite a few of you, so there's my example. Right. How many of you don't have a Facebook page? Actually, there's quite a few of you, so that's more than I would normally have at this point. Uh, I should put my hand up there too. Okay, so it's easy to profile people now. Uh, it's easy to find out about people's commercial situation. It's easy to find out about people's, maybe their political beliefs, maybe their friends, their networks. And that can be linked in with CCTV. Okay, now this, this um, for example, I'll give, I'll, give you, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you one example of a system that's been trialled in America. And this system is um, in a shopping centre. Okay, and you walk into a shopping centre and um, the CCTV cameras identify you. They use face recognition and other sorts of recognition. But there's also a profiling going on instantaneously behind the scenes. Now that profiling is identifying what you're interested in as a, as a shopper. Okay, now, and, the, and what happens as a result, I'll give you an example that I've, I've read about. I haven't seen this in my own eyes. Um, for example, if you buy a new car every year, Okay, they, they, this, this is easy to profile. Okay, and they've, they've identified you, they've identified one of your particular shopping habits that you buy a new car every year. If it's coming up to the time of your purchase of a new car, now you would not be surprised then that what will happen is that the adverts will change as this person walks through the shopping centre. He will be inundated with um, the adverts of new cars. Also, things can be sent to your mobile phone, adverts for new cars. So, you know, this CCTV has been integrated into the internet and into profiling and into databases. Now, this obviously is very futuristic. I haven't heard anything quite like this in the UK. Um, but what we, what we do have in terms of the development of, uh, of cameras and social settings is we have the widespread use of social media. We have millions of cameras on smartphones, okay? And they are being used increasingly... Um, the, the footage from those has increasingly been uploaded onto YouTube and onto the internet and increasingly these are becoming part of um, surveillance systems more generally so um, you know the, the, uh, the footage can be sent back to a control centre um, and in some ways what you can also have is circumstances where um, people can use, use those, those systems for surveying the people undertaking the surveillance through CCTV so it can be used. It can be re returned back on the, uh, the usual usual suspects. Oh, that's the wrong way. Okay, so just quickly on smart CCTV. Then um, this was my own definition: a visual surveillance system integrated with other ICTs, capable of automatically processing images alongside other digital information for predefined purposes. So image analysis, new sensory devices, new data integration capabilities, and it's perceived therefore to be more intelligent. Hence the term smart. Um, I did do a presentation recently about how smart is, is CCTV really. Um, the idea here is that it's actually changing the landscape for CCTV. So whereas I talked earlier on slides about CCTV um, requiring human operatives being more reactive than proactive, maybe smart CCTV will, will change that situation somewhat. Okay, so how do we understand the CCTV revolution in the UK? Okay, now this is much closer to my academic writing. So what I've tried to argue is that um, what we see in the UK is we see a policy environment that's been created which is amenable to the provision of CCTV. And we can look at certain features of that policy environment and they can help us understand why CCTV is so popular and why, why it has been deployed so, so widely. Okay, so first of all, we have a political and a public discourse which shapes the desire for systems, uh, downplays civil liberties, promotes the benefits of surveillance cameras. So if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. I like to say if I have a penny for every time I hear someone say that, I'd be a rich man. Um, of course, this isn't, this isn't really a correct argument if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, because we all have things that we may want to hide. And it's not even actually about hiding things, it's about being private. 
It's about the degree to which we have a right to have certain parts of our lives private. Now, you can have a debate, you can have an intellectual debate about whether or not we have a right to privacy. Uh, the, degree to, the degree to which we should be private in a public space. Okay, that's an interesting debate. Okay, but certainly there are certain places where we expect more levels of privacy. Okay, politicians are eager to demonstrate they're doing something in the fight against crime. It was originally the fight against crime, then it was the fight against terror, or the fight against antisocial behaviour. Now, the interesting thing about CCTV is that, as a new technology, we didn't really know what it would achieve. Therefore, there is scope for people to tell us what it would deliver. Okay, so that discourse around CCTV was about shaping our perceptions. There was no evidence that CCTV would work. There was no evidence that CCTV wouldn't work. Okay, so in the early days, it was about politicians and about policy makers and those who were interested in CCTV telling us, presenting arguments about what it would do and for us to buy, uh, for us to buy into those arguments. Also, in the early days, there was availability of resources for in installation of systems. Okay, so in the early days, um, that not only was there... Um, a discourse about the, the benefits of CCTV, but there was the availability of money. Okay, so if you were a police force or a local authority, and someone would say, we'll give you all of the money it requires to set up a CCTV system, um, you're not going to say no, are you? And many local authorities didn't. And many local authorities who wanted to say no, um, I was approached in the, in the late 90s by a few local authorities that said, look, we're very sceptical about CCTV. We're uncomfortable with our... Our, our electors thinking that we're watching them, that we're big brother. We want to resist CCTV, but we've got central government trying to throw money at us. We've got the police telling us how useful it would be. Even our citizens are telling us they want it. So local authorities felt cornered, um, and the availability of money was almost the final straw for them. So many of them felt, well, we, we, if we have a system, we'll make sure it's a, 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 as good as we can, we can achieve and as, as, as protected as we can. And we also see vested interests benefiting from the provision of CCTV. So this is, this is where you might come into my, my policy process work, where I'm interested in the policy environment, the actors and the institutions that are acting. So you find that there's a security industry pushing CCTV. They're looking for new markets for their products. You find that the police are very interested in CCTV. Now, obviously, the police have a different reason for being interested in CCTV than a local authority. A local authority may be interested in the protection of the community, but a police, the police may see it as a tool, a tool for helping them with investigations, a tool for helping manage their resources. So that some of the early arguments were about, well, you will just install cameras and then reduce the number of police officers. So these were some of the early arguments that were had. The criminal justice system, it is argued, benefits enormously from CCTV. Um, and the anecdotal evidence <laughs> suggests that um, if... A uh, suspect is presented with video footage of themselves committing some sort of crime that they will typically uh, admit guilt. And that saves a long, arduous process through the, through the criminal justice system and saves a lot of money. Now, the interesting thing about that is the assumption that the evidence that's presented is of a good enough quality for, for a court. Okay? And often they are not. Um, and there you, if, if the footage is, is problematic, you need a, an expert to come in and say, yes, that person uh, perpetrating that mugging is the person standing there in the, in the dock. Okay, so the point here is that in the, in the 90s, you had, a, if you like, a kind of a, an environment created where there were so many interests that were in favour of CCTV. It meant that the environment was conducive to CCTV being deployed. And if you like, one of the key points of that, of, of, of the process, was actually CCTV entering our general consciousness as something that might be useful. And the, the example that's often given is the murder of Jamie Bolger. Now, as I'm sure you all remember, but I'll just remind you very briefly, Jamie Bolger was a toddler who was taken away in a shopping centre by two other children and was murdered. Okay? Now, CCTV did not stop that happening. But what CCTV did was it portrayed around the country the images of that toddler being taken away. And as a result of that, the police or the investigators knew instantly what had happened, although they couldn't stop it, or it didn't stop it, 
Um, but also, as a, as a society, we saw the potential usefulness of CCTV. We understood that what CCTV could do. So we became very conscious of it. Okay, so this was part of the kind of general awareness. Also, we start to see things like... Uh, we, we start to see things like, uh, I'm trying to remember what they were called, but there were more and more programmes on TV of, that were made up of CCTV footage. Police camera action, I think, is one of them, where we see, you know, we see how wonderful it is as the police catch another, another, another person committing another offence. And I think there are still some of those... Uh, I, my, I catch my son occasionally watching uh, police car chases using CCTV footage. So these things are still on TV now. Um, Okay, and then finally, this is the point I was started off with, that surveillance is quite a normal practice, that we under, intrinsically we understand that there's a need for surveillance, um, and therefore CCTV is kind of feeding into that. So I would say, you know, as someone who isn't a criminologist, as someone who isn't a lawyer, that we understand, we should understand the CCTV revolution as, as, a, as partly a political process, a policy process, a process which involves different actors, different institutions, and in this era... Um, this, it's almost as though the stars aligned and it became possible to diffuse CCTV widely. Now, I have been asked at this point in the past, well, if that was the case then, can that be reversed? Can the circumstances change that CCTV can be, um, can, um, can be removed? Um, and, I, and I would argue that it's actually very difficult. Theoretically, yes. Um, there is an interesting book by, uh, by a Scot called Donald Mackenzie, which is about how you can theoretically uninvent the nuclear bomb. But it's going to be, it would be very hard. Um, and the same goes for CCTV. It's very hard to wind back the clock, especially as now um, we're finding that CCTV is being pushed into more and more areas and it's being spread around the globe. Um, I saw an interesting presentation recently about CCTV in Chile, um, and they had a really interesting sign on their street um, CCTV, it was translated to me, but I hope the person wasn't pulling my leg, but he told me that the sign said um, that CCTV is installed in this shopping centre to make you more comfortable when you're shopping and spending money, was the literal translation. So uh, I wish we had signs like that here. OK, I thought it would be interesting if I gave you um, something about CCTV in Scotland. Scotland is um, slightly different to the rest of the UK. There has a number of pictures <coughs> of the Scottish CCTV environment that are unique. Um, like the rest of the UK, most of the systems went in in the mid to late 1990s, most of the public space systems that is. And like the rest of the UK, they were initially for crime prevention and detection, and more latterly community safety and anti-terrorism. Unlike the rest of the UK, they were initially operated mostly by the police. Okay? And it was only in the late 1990s that um, the transfer of the operation of CCTV went over to local authorities. But the problem with the transfer over to local authorities was that local authorities were then also expected to run the systems, maintain the systems, and pay for the systems. And this has been a, a cause of some dispute over a number of years. So now we have in Scotland the local delivery management operation by local authorities. Um, a couple of years ago, the Scottish Government undertook a review of CCTV in Scotland, specifically public space systems. Um, and what they argued was that CCTV provision in Scotland is very fragmented. Different places use different systems in terms of their technological capability. Different um, places have different working practices. How long they keep a recording for? The quality of the images? How many, how many hours a day do they man their control centres? And they were arguing that it was very different from one area to another. And they said the problem for this was that criminal, the courts, for example, were always being presented with different evidence. The problem for this was it was very difficult to centralise and standardise. So I have uh, heard people say, well, this is good. This is good because we'll never have Big Brother so long as we have this kind of fragmented, dispersed sort of CCTV systems. So we start to see now central government in Scotland saying CCTV doesn't really work, which I think is amazing. After 15 years of investment in CCTV, we're now being told it doesn't really work. But that's because they want more investment. They want more investment to standardise systems. They want more investment to bring them up to uh, certain quality and make them, uh, make them interoperable. They also would like systems whereby you can take control of cameras from a remote location. Um, so all these sorts of things are now being built in to the current government policy. Now, the interesting thing about CCTV in Scotland is that you have this desire for centralisation and standardisation 
from central government, the Scottish government, but you have the provision of CCTV by local government. Okay, and local government are facing financial hardship at the moment. They don't see CCTV as a priority service. They see social services, education, other services as their, as their priority. They are not particularly interested in investing more and more money in CCTV. And they are starting to revisit their cameras. And they're starting to say, do we really need so much CCTV? And the motivation for that is finance. Okay, so they are getting to a point now where the cameras are quite old, they need replacing, or they're breaking down more often, they need more maintenance. So they're starting to question, what, do we really, what benefits do we really have from this camera? We don't, we don't necessarily want to jump to the tune of central government. Um, we perhaps would like to think about what the cameras are doing at a local level. So they're talking about, for example, having control centres which are, are multi-purpose. So it might be that they, uh, they have other alarm systems for other local authority premises. They have uh, sheltered housing control centres integrated with CCTV control centres. So they're looking to make CCTV part of other service areas. So CCTV provision is starting to be questioned. Um, the irony for me um, is that where I started from, which was, does CCTV work? Um, is it an, does it have an impact on civil liberties? If so, how do we explain the rise of CCTV? We're finally getting CCTV being questioned very seriously by central government and local government, but on the issue of finance, not on those other issues. Um, so basically, I, I would argue that CCTV is a defining feature of modern British society. Um, I would argue that we understand CCTV diffusion as a policy process as well as a technological process. Um, I would also argue that they are inherently powerful, that they are political, because they are about control. Okay? They are about controlling people's behaviour, and therefore, it's, in some respects, it's quite right that agencies like local authorities operate large CCTV systems. We wouldn't want private agencies doing that. So, um, in some ways, if we have these systems, then maybe local authorities are the right agencies to do it. Um, I also, I, um, if you look at my academic work, you'll see that I argue that policy processes and technological development are closely intertwined, and that's, that's how we understand CCTV. I would like to challenge the evidence base for CCTV um, in terms of the degree to which we understand CCTV, the degree to which it has impacts on society, and the evidence which supports CCTV. Um, and I believe that there's a further need for understanding and awareness of what CCTV does and how it impacts on society. And then finally was the point I was making on the previous slide. So I think I'll finish there. Uh, if you want to look at any of my work, I've just put one, one article down here. But um, I'm quite, if you look for the University of Stirling and you look for William Webster, you'll find me. There's lots of, uh, lots of bits and pieces there that you, you, you're welcome to read at some point or another. And I'll finish there. Thank you.